Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio again, and this is my DIY epoxy dining table build. In this build, I'm going to show you all the steps to go from that slab on the left to the really nice dining table on the right, uh, from buying the slabs here at Gobi Walnut, all the way to how I got those really cool photographs using a method called light painting. If you saw my last video, there's going to be a lot of the same steps that I followed in that smaller coffee table build as I did this large dining table. Uh, specifically this 8 foot by 42 inch template I made. The finished dining table ended up being 9 feet, but that was only because we found a slab that was big enough to accommodate it. So I basically just go around from slab to slab helping visualize what they'll look like with this template. The good thing about Gobi Walnut is there is no shortage of slabs. I have, I wouldn't say endless supply, but a really good supply of slabs to till I can find just the right one. This seems a little too convenient that the perfect slab for me was actually just sitting on the floor, not even in the racks, but this is actually pretty much how it played out. I never thought I'd be able to get a single slab for a table this wide. I plan on using multiple slabs, but I was able to make this entire table from one piece of wood. I can really get used to this forklift thing because once I get home, it's going to be all manual labor to move it around. Here we are back at the home shop. I built this rolling cart recently that actually makes moving these slabs a lot easier uh, despite how it looks here. Tried about everything to get this thing started and finally able to budget there. Here's a nice overview of what the slab looks like before we get really digging into it. It is a black walnut, it's actually Claro walnut, which is a type of black walnut. Unbelievable color and figure. Gonna be a lot of work, but it's gonna be a nice slab. First thing I did to get started was uh, using these bench chisels to remove the bulk of the rot. I have this Porter Cable Restorer here. I have a stainless steel wheel on it, and that's another good uh, tool to use for helping remove any of the softwood. One of my favorite things about this is that you can hook it up to a vacuum, which is really nice in a small shop. More chisel work, just getting anything soft out of there. We want nice hard wood to be the only thing that's left after we're done cleaning these edges up. Like I mentioned before, the template was for an eight foot by 42 inch table. And I talked to my client and they were actually able to extend it to nine feet in their space. We could have actually probably gone to 10 feet, but uh, nine feet was all their space would allow. So I extended the template to help me visualize it using the chalk line. And I always give myself a couple extra inches um, from the minimum dimensions that I need. That way you can, it's always easier to cut it down. You obviously can't make it bigger. So I have two festival tracks and I also have the extenders to combine both of them to make one long track, but both of those were not long enough to make this cut. So I came up with a little trick that worked out pretty well that I'll show you here shortly on how to get a straight line using the one track and just moving it up. So here's the trick. I put these shims in to prevent the binding and I found out that I could actually line the track up with those shims and have it stay perfectly straight. So there you go. If you have a Festool or a Makita or you're a DeWalt track saw, I really like these DeWalt uh, track saw clamps. They're about a third the price of the good Festool ones and I think they work even better. So it's probably pretty obvious to you that we are just using the side that I cut off to fill in the other side of this table here. Just want to make my same chalk lines there and there. At 
these track saws really do make jobs like this infinitely easier. I highly recommend getting one. It doesn't have to be a Festool. I love the Festool one because it's the deepest cut of any of them, but I highly recommend getting one. I also love using my table saw crosscut jig whenever I have the chance. It's a nice, safe tool to use. It wasn't quite a deep enough cut, so I had to flip it over here. Even worked my miter saw into this build. This small piece in the bottom right was actually a client's request, and I didn't like the idea at first, and once the table was finished, I couldn't imagine doing without that piece. So a piece of advice is actually listen to the clients. They, they occasionally do have some good ideas. Here I'm using the angle grinder and the stainless steel wheel to continue to remove any of the soft wood left in there. I'm not crazy about using the angle grinder if you're doing a transparent epoxy because you will see the marks that it leaves, but this is going to be a black epoxy so you won't see any of the marks on the wood. Also it makes a lot of dust whereas the restore or other tools with dust collection are almost dust free. Here I'm going to seal all the edges with epoxy, and this is a faster drying. I believe this is a West System epoxy. You could use the UV epoxy by Ecopoxy. The reason I do this is I don't want any of the color bleed to come in and stain the wood. There are some people that don't do this uh, and have great results with it. You'll get some bubbles if you do not seal the edges. Um, also can get that color bleed, so I personally recommend sealing it, but if you decide not to, that's totally up to you. The people that don't seal the edges uh, do so because they feel you get a better bond with the epoxy actually penetrating the wood, and I do agree with that. So if you do seal them, make sure to scuff it up to give a good bond for the epoxy. Here I'm going to start making the form, and I use melamine. I pretty much always use melamine. If you use the mold release, you can actually use these forms over and over again. I'm cutting my sides there. This table is going to be longer than the standard 8-foot sheet of melamine, so I have to put this extender piece in here, which isn't a big deal. I'm just going to caulk that joint and then put the house sealant tape over it. But we'll come back to this form. This is another step I feel that a lot of people skip. I, I would not skip this one really for any reason. What I'm doing is I'm sealing the whole thing with a shellac and it goes on really quick, dries super fast. And the reason I'm doing this is if you spill any epoxy, uh, any little drips, which you will, there's just no way around it, it'll stain the wood. On more porous woods, lighter woods, it can be more prevalent. Walnut's not the worst for it, but it only takes about 15 minutes to seal the entire slab and will make a ton of difference from if, in case you get any stains. Okay, back to the form. I make these sides about an inch taller than the overall thickness of the entire table. That way you don't have to worry about any of it spilling out over the top. Anybody who's done enough of these tables has had a leak, so that's why I'm putting that plastic down. Also, this mold release is clutch. Absolutely don't skip this. Some people use the tape, and I've done that before. I think I did that in my last video, but the mold release actually works just as well and is a lot easier, so I say go with the mold release. If I was a bigger shop or I had more friends, maybe I'd be able to load this slab into a completed form, but since I was all by myself, I had to build the form around it wasn't too big of a deal. Same steps. I use the fast drying caulk. Don't use the silicone. I made that mistake. I believe I actually made this, that mistake on this table. It makes the sides really hard to get off. So that 20 minute caulk is my go-to. I won't have any physical supports other than the epoxy holding all these sides together. Not worried about it at all, but other times I have put supports underneath. I forgot to make a video of me putting this silicone dam around the top, and that's all it actually is. It's gonna, once we fill this all the way up to the top, it's gonna hold the epoxy back. Ever since I discovered Eco Epoxy, uh, specifically this two to one kit, I have not gone back to any other for any of my river tables. You can use them. I've built tables using other epoxy. It takes a lot of work. Uh, results aren't nearly as good. I only recommend using this Eco Epoxy. Again, make sure you get the two to one kit though. That is clutch. Eco Epoxy is pretty forgiving as far as epoxy goes in terms of 
you don't have to get the ratio down to the exact drop when it comes to that two to one ratio. Just fill it to the line, two to one, dump them both into a bucket. Mix your dyes very thoroughly. This is a trans tint liquid dye. I've had great luck with it. Ecopoxy makes good dyes. I've heard a company Black Diamond makes good dyes. I haven't used them yet. A good trick is to count the number of drops when you're mixing this if you're trying to match a color. I'm using my uh, mixer attached to a drill. Mix it for about a minute, maybe two minutes. You don't have to mix it, mix it for 10 minutes or anything. Just get the sides, the bottom, make sure it's all very thoroughly mixed. Generally, you can pour Ecopoxy up to two inches. I decided to make this table during a crazy heat wave we were having in Oregon, so I limited myself to three quarters of an inch. It was probably a little more cautious than I needed to be, but if you do overheat this epoxy, if you pour it too thick when it's too hot out, the whole thing can react and crack and ruin the entire pour. You gotta break it all out, uh, buy a whole bunch of new epoxy. So I played it a little cautious and did these three quarters of an inch pours. If you time these pours before the first one is completely hardened, you don't need to scuff it up. It'll chemically bond to the first pour naturally. So I did that at about a 48 hour interval when it was just kind of tacky hard, but not completely cured. You'll see a lot of bubbles in these pours here. And if you've worked with other epoxies, you're probably thinking now's the time that I need to pop those. You actually don't need to with Ecopoxy. It seems counter, especially people that have done a lot of epoxy work. They will naturally pop themselves on their own in about that 48 hours. After my depth looked good, I decided to touch up some of these smaller spots with a syringe. It's a nice tool to get into the uh, cracks. Don't have to worry about wasting as much. This was actually a jello injector, so it wasn't exactly the highest quality. I realized I actually lied there. This was my second to last pour. I didn't mix up quite enough. You can see it's not uh, quite up to the top line there. I did one small pour after this. So a total of four pours, which is too many if you ask me. I probably could have done it in two pours, um, maybe one if I was really cautious. So cooling the epoxy, this is the key if you want to do these thicker pours. It may or may not have even been necessary with these shallow pours that I was doing, but all you need to do is get a couple fans. If you wanted to do a two to maybe three inch pour, I'd have a few more fans than this. And at the 12 to 15 hours, you just monitor that temperature with a heat gun and don't let it get over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's it for part one. Uh, click on part two now. I'm gonna give a bunch of sanding tips, epoxy touch-up tricks, how I attach my legs, even an entire photography tutorial on how I take my photos. Thanks for watching.